right exactly at three o'clock, the police arrived. We were uh, we had a habit of not meeting in the main hall, the main house. The main house was for the boss, <laughs> so we had to meet uh, um, outside in the uh, 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 what do you call it outbuildings. Uh, as we were assembling, the police came in. A van came in. Uh, what is it? Um, uh, Laundry van. Then the police jumped out. They came to the uh, art building where we were supposed to be meeting. Um, I jumped out, Govan and Kathy, through the window, but they were already there. And um, indicated that uh, you, one move we shoot. And then the dogs were also there. So they we were unable. We had intention of running, running through this uh, the, the window and then down to the river. We were unable, they got us there. Uh, Goldreich, if you know Goldreich, he lived a, a lifestyle deliberately, uh, the, what you would call the northern suburbs uh, lifestyle, you know, going out horse riding on a Saturday morning, that type of a thing and uh, constant traffic of delivery vans and so forth. Uh, so we did not think this thing was any, anything unusual, this, uh, this uh, dry cleaning van. The farm belonged to the Communist Party. It was a farm that was known to a very small number of people, very, very small number. The Communist Party allowed it to be used by Comrade Mandela when he was underground. The Communist Party also allowed it to be used by some of the early MK people who had returned from training, but on condition that as soon as they find their places, they should move. I went to Rivonia for purposes of disguise, and then uh, I had moved on to another place in Mountain View, now disguised as a Portuguese. Uh, Communist Sulu was also there temporarily. He had moved out. We had gone to Rivonia to discuss Operation Mayabuya. A meeting had take pla taken place on the Saturday. Operation Mayabuya document was put there. A counter document was put. That meeting was not conclusive. So we met on Thursday, the 11th of July, to continue this discussion. And we, uh, we had by that time all moved away from Rivonia. I was brought back on the 10th of uh, July at night uh, to Rivonia and Commissar Sulu and them came at about two, quarter past two, to the farm and the police raided at about three and arrested us. We had used Rivonia too much and um, the fact that we could all be arrested there, I think it was a mistake on the part of some of us who felt that uh, let's have that first last, last mistake, um, last day rather, um, I think to some extent we were. But these things were inevitable. We had to be arrested at one stage or another. Um, the only criticism you can have, it was uh, rather, well, <coughs> um, too short a period. The people who go underground in various parts of the world, they don't go beyond six, uh, one year, two years. They, are, they get arrested. And uh, I think to us, because it was rather shorter than that. And our plan, therefore, was, had shortcomings. I can't remember. It was quite a shock, of course. But then when you are when you're underground, you know, you know that sooner or later you're going to be caught. Because you never know under what circumstances you're going to be caught. But sooner or later you're going to be caught. So the impact is lessened a bit by this knowledge that sooner or later you're going to be caught. But this was too dramatic. They did not recognize me uh, in my disguise. They didn't recognize me immediately. It's only when I spoke that they recognized me. They had come there obviously looking for Susulu. Uh, they had some tip off that Susulu is going to be there. They didn't expect a lot. 
Well, I say this because I'm told that uh, immediately they found us all. Uh, Colonel Van Vick, at that time Lieutenant Van Vick, who was in charge of the Rivonia arrests, made a phone call to headquarters and said, on such a jackpot. I was, of course, uh, on a, the regional command uh, of MK right from the beginning. We made preparations uh, before the 16th of December, uh, identifying places for sabotage, what type of uh, sabotage, whether they should be uh, incendiary or explosives, or simply cutting of wires, so uh, reconnoitering places. And then I personally took part uh, just in two activities. One involved uh, uh, cutting of wires, telephone or electricity, I can't even remember now. And one was an incendiary bomb. I was uh, to prepare the conference in Botswana. And I was already in Botswana when it was announced that um, the police, uh, it was wrong, wrongly announced, the police had already pinned a notice in my door. It meant that, therefore, once they pin that no notice, if they see you anywhere, they will arrest you. That made me to leave the conference before it actually commenced. I didn't meet Oliver, who was also coming to the conference. I had to leave to come home and try and beat this uh, ban so that I can do my work underground in South Africa. It had been decided that I was going to operate in South Africa. And therefore, I had to try and um, uh, uh, avoid see, being arrested at that stage. Uh, I got home, however, found that they had not yet pinned the, uh, the order. And they, they however, came. Um, I can't remember precisely whether they, I, I don't think they came to give me the ban, but the ban, you see, my ban began. I then went underground from that um, day uh, so that I should operate underground. Kathrada also went underground by orders that he should go down underground. It, it brought about that this new situation that uh, all operations were largely going to be underground. Well, to be frank, my views were mixed with fear. Fear not only for myself, and that was there, naturally, but also fear for the organization. I thought that uh, we were being a bit uh, incautious, uncautious, I don't know, you know what the correct English is. Uh, I think uh, that was that element was there. I thought that not sufficient thought was being given. A small group of people were now directing things. And uh, what really, uh, and of course the other uh, reason was I did not have the aptitude for this type of, of work. But that's a personal thing. Uh, there was one incident, for instance, where uh, uh, we were discussing a certain act of sabotage, whether we should plant an incendiary bomb or an explosive. And I had said, look, uh, this is an area where children play till 10, sometimes 11 at night. And if we plant an explosive, uh, it will kill these children. And the response from one of the MK leaders was, well, comrade, people die in the struggle. And that shocked me, that type of an attitude. Because the idea at the time was not violence aimed at civilians or the security forces. At that time, the emphasis was on sabotage of uh, buildings, uh, government buildings, etc. And that worried me. Uh, one of the reasons why I thought uh, I should withdraw. But I must emphasize the element of fear was there. 
the element of uh, inaptitude for this thing, there's no enthusiasm for this type of work, more enthusiasm for political work. The case had um, provoked great interest internationally and at home. Um, I had no doubt in my mind that the death penalty was going to be imposed because I knew the extent of preparations made to sabotage the, con the material that was ordered and uh, that uh, in any country this type of a thing would be met by a death penalty and worse, therefore, in a fascist country. And therefore, the defense had to take into consideration what our situation was. We deliberately decided that uh, the best thing was to attack and openly admit this is what we've done, this is our aim, we were to be to use it now as it were as an attack on the state. And that is the type of defense we brought about. We agreed all certain things. We defied when they said what about questions which we thought were incriminating. And um, we refused to answer questions. That was the line. But we had to say what we thought was right and what would be, um, uh, be useful in mobilizing the country, in creating a spirit of revolt in the country. That was our defense. Comrade Mandela and Sasulu in particular were, uh, 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 you know, leading us on the, towards this realization that this is going to be, it may end in death, but we cannot do otherwise than to conduct it as a political trial. So that in the first day when we were called upon to plead, we didn't just say, I'm not guilty. Each one of us made a one sentence statement. Some of us said, uh, it is not I who should be on trial, but Foster who should be on trial. Uh, that type of thing. So the tone was set right from the beginning to conduct it as a political trial. It was also decided that those uh, particularly in the leadership of MK, against whom there's going to be quite a bit of evidence in any case, should admit uh, their uh, participation in things. Now, I was, for instance, charged for being a member of the National High Command, which I never was. I was never near the High Command. And it was felt that there is no point in my now admitting something that was not even true. So that uh, while my defense was political, it did not go to the extent of my admitting that I was uh, uh, involved in MK activities. At the time, of course, I was not involved at all. Well, um, it was clear from the discussions we were having with the lawyers that at least four of us were going to be sentenced to death. That is uh, Governor Beggy, Nelson Mandela, Dennis Goldberg, and myself. And we were therefore preparing statements which were going to be used in the event of a death sentence. And, um, um, but uh, fortunately for us, the judge who gave us an impression that, um, at least me, that there was no other sentence he was going to pass. He was, uh, it was uh, sh shaken, his uh, guns, you know, were move, moving very fast. And I was wondering why would he be frightened unless he was going to pass a death sentence? If it was not, why would he be uh, so shaken? Um, so that I was quite sure that he was going to pass a death sentence. My wife had been seen by my lawyer who said, well, prepare for anything. And this was the situation in which we are. When the final sentence was passed, um, life sentence, it was like a discharge.
because we had expected something worse. We were locked up uh, after uh, we were taken back to jail and we were told to that that night we were going to I mean, for, uh, we are going to be in communal cells. They had already told us that we'll be seeing our visitors the next day and the lawyers and so forth. But that very night, they came at about uh, 12 or 1 o'clock and suddenly put on the lights and they said, get ready. And then they chained us, handcuffed us and the leg irons. I was chained to Mbeki, I remember. And uh, under very, very strong security, the army, the police and the prison, we were driven to a military airport, put on the plane and, and taken to Robben Island. So, the, you know, we were sentenced on the 12th, Friday the 12th of June and the 13th of June we were already on Robben Island. We were handcuffed, you know, chained and so on, and on a helicopter. We were together in that helicopter, helicopter with the police. But one of the uh, policemen uh, was talking to Kathy, saying that, well, um, you people are not going to stay long there, not because of your efforts, because our government will decide to, to, to release you. In fact, uh, he said that, uh, I don't even think you're going to take five years. We are not going to allow you as matters. This is how he put it. We got there uh, in the morning, and uh, the cells in which they were preparing for us were not yet ready. We were put, you see, I think, um, in the cells which kept common law prisoners. Well, I must say for me, a person, I was already relieved. And um, I was out of Pretoria with all its uh, frustrating uh, appearance and shouting and all that. I was feeling that I am here in a new situation and I was now determined, no matter how long. And I, I was free mentally as from that moment. The very first thing that struck us, of course it was very cold and uh, windy and rainy as Cape Town is at that time of the year. And the very first thing that happened there was, uh, again, the, 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 the blow uh, that we felt about how cruel apartheid could be. Now, when we landed on Roman Island, I was the youngest of the Rivonia group. Uh, and I was the only Indian or non-African. And the apartheid as, as it applied, you know, when we had to change our clothes, for instance, the regulations provided for Indians and coloreds to be given long pants, Africans, short pants, Africans, uh, no socks. And re according to regulations, they should not have shoes but uh, sandals. Uh, in our case, of course, they made that concession and allowed Count Mandela and them to, to have shoes, but no socks and short pants. That was the first thing. Then the food. Again, discrimination in food. Uh, uh, you know, porridge, we get the same porridge, but they'd get less sugar. Uh, they get no bread. Uh, Indians and colors would get bread, Africans only porridge. And uh, eventually they make a concession that they'd be allowed to buy bread once a year at Christmas time. To reorganize ourselves in that situation was a new uh, battle. And um, they were formed, you see the structures, we exchanged views. Um, this, we started with it by napping stones in the yard and the harassment by the warders. But uh, we had taken a decision because we were organized. We were not going to accept harassment by the warders. And we were not going to be pushed. And they were now attempting to charge us uh, you want to, you have to fill in so many wheelbarrows for the type of work we are doing. But we resented this type of a thing and we wanted to fight this issue legally as far as this was concerned. But that was the situation. Uh, it was not west of the yard, we're still going to these quarries. The quarries, um, um, we had to work and uh, load lo lorries 
and dig the, the quarry, but it was a lime quarry. Nonetheless, very difficult. Uh, nearly all of us had blisters uh, in our hands. We were singing in order, like all prisoners, in order to keep our spirit up. Uh, but unlike the accepted uh, tendency in jail, we were stopped from singing because they realized that keeps our morale up. The main thing they wanted to lower our morale um, by using all sorts of things, uh, but they did not succeed there. The, soon the question of charging us collapsed. And a um, very important thing was that uh, when they told us uh, to walk fast, we decided to walk even slower in defiance. They realized that this was difficult. They now recognize the leadership. I wanted to talk to, wanted to, talk to Mr. Mandela and recognize that he was the leader of the group. And uh, they exchanged views and explained to them that we would not accept this type of uh, harassment. And the very fact that they now recognize him as a leader was an important uh, victory for us. Once you're in politics and illegal politics or underground, you go underground with the realization that you haven't got a, life, a long life span uh, of freedom. So psychologically, you, you, you know that uh, sooner or later you're going to be caught. Uh, then some of us had been to prison before, uh, if not most of us. So we know what a prison is. And then thirdly, and I suppose most importantly, to us it was a continuation of the struggle in another terrain, another environment. And uh, while we were there, we knew the struggle had to continue. Uh, whereas outside, we could sit at an illegal meeting like this uh, in, a, in a small house or something. The enemy is remote. He's just not there. But in prison, he's there 24 hours a day. He's watching over you. So that even if you weaken, you dare not allow yourself to, to, to weaken because you don't want to weaken in front of the enemy.